They start from approximately six centuries, the ones that I've so far shown, and this would be around ninth century in Uttar Pradesh. And this is very interesting because we all have heard of Ardhanarishwara. And um, I, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out, you know, I couldn't get any myth in the Purans as to why Parvati had become half of Shiva's body. Then in a very obscure book, there was a folk tale from Tamil Nadu in which they tried to explain the Ardhanarishwara, so I, I got hold of that. Now, it's very interesting that we all know that Shiva is Ganga Dhar. He makes Ganga sit on his head. We are told that Parvati was so jealous as a wife that pa Ganga was sitting on the head of Shiva that she went and did tapas, she did penance, and Shiva said, what do you want? You've done such hard penance. So he, she says, I would like to become half of your body. So that she could keep an eye on Ganga and see that Ganga doesn't go into Shiva, Shiva's body through his ear or through some other way. So we are told that that is one reason why she became Ardhanarishwara. The other one that I found far more interesting and which is also showing a lot of sectarian rivalry and cultic rivalry is that Shiva and Parvati were standing where all their bhaks, all their devotees were coming and worshipping them. And the way of worship as you know is to circumambulate. And they were circumambulating Shiva and Parvati and going away. But you know, there came a time within Hinduism and in our country, in the Indian subcontinent, where people had one devta, ishta devta, and nobody else. And there were people who were very pugnacious and very particular about just following that one god. So there came this one particular bhakt attendant of Shiva called Bringi. And Bringi means wasp, and I'll tell you why in a moment. So he's, Bringi came. And he saw the two of them standing there, and instead of circumambulating both of them like he should have, like the rest of them were doing, he only circumambulates Shiva and goes away. Now, Parvati, we are told she has her own ego. She was an autonomous goddess, she did not like that. And it's, it's told in that story that she goes to the forest, she does her penance, comes back, Shiva, who is Bolenath, who always gives you what you want if you do penance properly, he, he tells her what you want. So she said, I want to be one half of your body. So he said, okay. And why does she want? So that that Bringi circumambulates both of them. <laughs> so she becomes the second half and they're standing over there again. All the followers are coming and circumambulating. Bringi comes and sees this and goes away. Look at the text of it, the stories that are written. He goes away. He's such a follower of Shiva. He says, no way am I going to go around Parvati. And he does penance and he becomes a bumblebee. Bringi means bee. In, in Sanskrit. Okay, one Bringi, there is also Bringeshwar, which is the lower of Bringi, that's Shiva. Anyway, Bringi becomes a bee, comes and punctures a hole between Shiva and Parvati's body. This half, the left half is always Parvati. He punctures a hole here and only circumambulates Shiva. And then in some of the texts that I read, Parvati gets enraged. In my books, I have said that Parvati bows down to him and says, my God, we have to bow down to a great buck like you. And she, she's reconciled to the fact that there will be people who will only follow Shiva. And there will be people who will only follow Durga. Durga. So you can see this as sectarian rivalry, cultic tension between the worshippers of Shiva and the worshipper of the goddess. Next please. Yes. So are there any so, ma'am, we know that uh, Parvati was an uh, in individualistic uh, goddess somewhere. So, ma'am, do we see instances of her challenging Shiva? Yes. She challenges, they're the very famous ones, the dancers would know about it, where she, cha uh, she doesn't challenge, he challenges her that he's a better dancer. And uh, it's again a South Indian myth, and uh, they're doing, they're going neck and neck. And then he raises his leg up there. And her modesty, yeah, and her modesty prevents her from putting her leg up like that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Can you hear her at the back? Can just speak with your little back? That particular movement and that positioning of the leg is called yoga thunder. Okay. That's not. It's not him that did it. It's her, and it's a beautiful description. Oh, wonderful! Really, wonderful. Her leg raised like that, and the ankle, you know, with the ankle, the guru around it, 
uh, like a swarm of bees. Okay. And this uh, flower like uh, fruit coming out of that swarm of bees. Okay. So uh, there are other texts that say he didn't win. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that. Not, not at Johnson and not at <laughs> dancing. <laughs> shows that, that we can be, and, and also yoga, you know, the, the Prakriti and Purusha, there are a whole lot of different uh, ideas that go into, Ellen Goldberg has written a lot about Arthanishwara. But uh, as a, I was trained by Marxist historians, and I was very happy to be able to say that there shows sectarian rivalry. That's the one that I believe the most. Because when I looked at Madhya Pradesh, and I looked at all the murtis there, uh, Arthanishwara was not something that appealed to the people. There were such few murtis as compared to Uma Maheshwar Murti, Gauri Shankar Murti, Mahisha Sur Martani. So when I did a comparison, I found that it was not an idea that seems to be, maybe it was too modern. It didn't seem to appeal to the people that much. So just about six or seven. And when you look at uh, Mahisha Sur Martani, there are like 200 images, 300 images. So where, where do you find most um, Ardhanarsvara? You find them in the south, just depicted in not in not just full temples on Arthanamishwara, no. On the panels, you find them, you find them in Madhya Pradesh also, but very few in them. Yes. This is about the Yes, yes. yes. And, uh, how does it connect with the Mandipur uh, Commission? Yes, yes. <coughs> Yes. Yes, that's the earliest mention of Chattushwara. And uh, but they have we haven't uh, I haven't seen that explanation. The only explanation that I saw, in fact I saw this morning, was that it had to do with the four tenets of Shaiva Siddhanta. So I still am in the process of trying to find this out. It's a fairly new slide that I've got, but I want to go with more detail. Why has he shown with the four legs? Yes. Anyone else? Yes. So I just wanted to ask, what was the first text in which Sati appears? And like, is there a clear uh, like bifurcation between Sati, like Sati being his wife, like that was the moment it ended, and then Padi? No. No. I did not find enough material on Sati at all. So when I wrote my chapter on Sati, I had to use my own imagination. There's not much material on Sati at all. And she's mentioned in the Shiv Puran. But very, just vaguely that, okay, Parvati's first, uh, first was Sati, not any much details. So I had to sort of like go through and use my imagination that Dutch, you know, was the father and he was very particular about everything. So I looked at second resources. There's a wonderful book called Ka yes, by the, uh, by the uh, Italian. He's talked about Sati, so but you can read that. Yes. Wasn't Sati the point from where the idea of the, this energy or the feminine energy or all these, uh, Shakti Peets or whatever they yes, originated. That's what I yeah. Yeah. They originated yeah. from there. So, so you know, so the it's it's the chicken and the egg, egg. What came first? Were those geographical spaces already being worshipped and then the the Puranic came along and connected them? We can't say. Yeah. Because in yeah. Assam they may have been worshipped much earlier. Now the Assam uh, Kamakya looks like a vagina and it bleeds, bleeds once in a, in the year with red water coming out, oxide, red oxide. So th that may have been worshipped by the people in that area for centuries. 
And then it was all brought through, the, you see the Qurans are very, very cunning, very wise and cunning. They put all the threads together and make it part of their own. That's what they do. Next please. Okay, that's calendar art, very obvious uh, Narishwar. And always with their vahans, uh, Parvati's vahan, a vehicle is the lion and you have Nangi there. Next please. Okay, this is uh, again very fascinating to me, this is Bringi. Now Bringi was cursed by Parvati, there was a, there was a, uh, everybody thought that when a child takes birth, when a child is born, then the fleshy parts and the blood comes from the woman and the bones come from the, the skeletal frame comes from the man's semen. So she curses Bringi, this is again a lot in the south, okay. She curses Bringi to such an extent that he loses all his flesh and he cannot support himself on two, two legs. So he, Shiva gives him a third leg. <laughs> so you can see Bringi with his three legs and this is also on temples in the south, uh, circa 10th, 11th century. All his ribcage shown over here, of course he's an ascetic. A devout worshipper of Shiva, but with three legs. Yes, next, please. That's again Bringi. Next. And then we can come to Ganesha. <laughs> I just want to sit down for a little while. Uh, we, uh, I, I, I can just say this: that where the family is concerned, Ganesha is the most loved son. Uh, Skanda Kartike with his six heads. Uh, it does not seem to have survived even today. You find Skanda Kartike up till the 6th or 7th century, you find images of him, but he's not, somehow he hasn't caught the imagination of the people. And that's what I was saying, survival of the fittest. You know, gods come and go. Gods come and go. In the south, yes, as Murugam he is, but uh, in large areas of north, east and west India, we find Ganesha has taken over as the offspring. And a lot of the calendar art only shows Ganesha in the lap of Shiva or Bhagavan. You will very rarely find that the, I, I would love to see that both those uh, children are there. But you don't find it. And in a very nice uh, temple in near Kanpur, you, ha, you see the sibling rivalry between Shiva, between Ganesha and Skandhikartike. And we know that there is this wonderful story of sibling rivalry between Ganesha and Skandhikartike when both of them are demanding to get married and the parents are saying, we just can't get you married like that. You have to become worldly wise and you have to travel all over the world. And whoever comes back after traveling the world, we will get you married. So Kartikeya has this swift peacock as his vahan. He takes off and then Ganesha, who has this huge stomach, has a vahan, which is a tiny little mouse. Both of them look at each other warily because the mouse knows he's going to get crushed and <laughs> Ganesha knows he's not going to get anywhere. So Ganesha. But when I did some series on personal development, you know, you can use these stories, I suppose. You have to see what, what your strengths are. Ganesha thinks and says, okay, let me not, let me still win this race. So he goes and bathes, he makes his parents sit down and he then circumambulates them and says, now give me my prize, give me my wife, I want to get married. And poor Skull Kartike, he's actually circumambulating the world. So he said, get me married. So what are you saying? You haven't budged from here, you're just here, you haven't gone anywhere. And so he says, yes, for a child, their parents are the world. I have circumambulated the world, and this is like really filming. <laughs> so, you know, that we, he, the parents have nothing to say. Neither Shiva or Parvati have nothing to say. They say, okay, he's so wise. He says, and he says, which young son should leave the parents alone at home and go off on the <laughs> I'm looking after you, I'm circumambulating you because you are the world, you are Prakriti, you are Purusha, you are my parents, you are everything. And he gets married first. So of course these delightful stories are there to entertain children, to entertain people, and uh, but they also show some kind of sectarian rivalry between Ganesha and Skandhikartikeya. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I'll sit down for a while in case anyone wants any more questions. I mean, I've told you most of what I want to tell you about how Shiva became a family man. He is not very happy being a family man. And uh, it is for this reason that constantly he leaves Parvati alone in the house and he goes off into the jungles to meditate because that's what he likes to do. He likes his yoga, he likes going inwards, he likes to meditate, he likes to be with his followers. He does not always want to be with her. In the Purans we find Skanda Puran, Linga Puran, Shiv Puran, we find constantly she's pleading with him. 
I want a child. Give me a child. And he's going on saying, why do we need a child? I am unborn and I'm never going to die. I am Ajashiva. Nothing's going to happen to me. Why do I want a child? I don't want a child. So you want a child? I'm not interested in a child. So he runs away from her. And so you see uh, a fight taking place always between Shiva and Parvati. Here he is, he's quite um, inconsiderate, I, I have to say, that he's not wanting to have a child. And it is in that sad moment that she's bathing and she puts the lape on her body. It's the fourth day after her menstruation that also has something to do with her giving birth at that time because that was the belief at that time. She takes the lape off her body and she makes a very cute little boy. And because she's a goddess, she infuses life into it. She insufflates breath into it. And it becomes a little boy in front of her. Shiva is nowhere around. And that is when she says, I love you so much. She puts him to her breast and she you know, loves him. She feeds him. She talks to him. Everything. Now, unbeknownst to Shiva, when he comes back, we all know the story. Ganesha is a little boy there. Not with the elephant head as yet, standing at the doorstep. While his mother is inside taking her bath. Now, in other Purans, what really struck me as marvelous, because I was so taken aback that no male historian had ever bothered to point this out. There were these, there were these instances when Parvati is talking to her two female attendants and saying, I hate the way Shiva barges into my bath without even letting me know that he's coming into my bath. I hate the way he interrupts me all the time. He has no decency. He just comes in. She's talking about her husband. And everybody here in this house of his only listens to Shiva. Nobody listens to me. I'm also a powerful goddess. Why doesn't anybody listen to me? I need a servant. She doesn't say son. I need a servant whom I can call my own. And that's when she makes Ganesha and she puts him stand, makes him stand there. Now what struck me was she, there's no maternal feeling over there. The typical stereotypical thing that a woman should feel. Motherly love. No. She's angry. Why is Shiva barging into my house, into my bathing area? And why don't I have anyone listening to me? Nobody had talked about it. So the moment I found it, it's like when you're going through the Qurans, there's so much of what you can say useless material. And suddenly you come across this aha moment and you say, my God, why has nobody talked about this? That was one instance when I was absolutely taken aback. And the second time was when we are told constantly about Kartike's birth. That when he was, Shiva and Parvati were making love, it went on for hundreds of years because they're great gods and goddess, goddess and you know, their love making goes on for years. And uh, the gods, the gods are always being shown like buffoons, really, a whole lot of them, like little clowns. Oh no, what's going to happen? They're making love, they're going to have an offspring who's going to be more powerful than us. Look at how powerful Parvati is, look at how powerful Shiva is. We are going to be defeated by that person. So we have to interrupt the love making. They interrupt the love making. And the semen goes to all kinds of containers, which we, I won't go into those details. In fact, in my book also, I felt a little uncomfortable talking about it because uh, that was the time when BJP was getting really strong and they may not have liked what I had to say. So I didn't talk about, in my book, which is a biography of Shiva, I have not talked about Skanda at all. Skanda means a squirt of semen. Kartikeya means the Kritikas who nursed him, the seven Kritikas, the Pleiades who nursed him. So anyway, now, in all the other texts that I read, Parvati is so disheartened that she was not able to conceive, she was not able to receive the seed of Shiva because she was interrupted in the lovemaking and she curses all the gods. In one marvelous place, she actually says, I curse you, Narad. I curse, curse you, Vishnu. I curse all of you who have interrupted me before I could reach sexual satisfaction. How dare you interrupt us when we are making love? That's it. Now, why? Why don't we talk about that? Look at the woman, the woman's point of view. Even today, people talk about these things. It's there in the Qurans, dated 7th century AD, 8th century AD, hidden among those verses that nobody is bothering and wanting to talk about. So you see this Parvati, this image of a woman who is so powerful, who voices her opinion, who is not always dying to have a son and following the whole maternal instinct kind of thing that we read about all the time. She is very happy having a servant. She has this Ganesha there. But then if you go back to the stereotypical story, then Shiva comes and as you know, a fight ensues because Ganesha has never seen Shiva. And so they fight with each other and his head is decapitated and we know that she, Parvati comes out and then she says, she threatens him. Again, you see the strong Parvati. 
most of the ten pricks we hear that she is uh, she is crying and she's pleading with Shiva. But in one of them, she says, "You know, I can become Kali. I will become Kali, and I will destroy you. You jolly well make my son come alive right now." And so he goes searching, running along with all his attendants. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much, and we can have questions. Thank you.